to call the uh, November 7th school committee meeting to order. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Tonight's uh, agenda is going to be a little bit uh, changed up a little bit from the order. So we'll, we'll start, as always, with public comment. Uh, then we'll have our consent agenda. Uh, with the exception of uh, Mara, uh, we will uh, leave reports until the end. Uh, after that, we'll go into the uh, the elementary uh, master planning report, and you know, just to set some expectations, this is this is something that we uh, uh, commissioned, I guess, last November around after town meeting, and this is merely an update or the report from that. Uh, we're not going to make any. Uh, decisions on this tonight we're just going to go through it and then there'll be uh, we'll set a schedule after that of uh, public participation and uh, with the school board and the town of various town officials uh, involved uh, so uh, and after that we'll uh, continue our discussion on the uh, superintendent's uh, goals and district improvement plan and, and finally uh, go into executive session uh, to discuss uh, non-represented personnel so uh, having said that is there any public input for nothing that's on the agenda seeing none uh, is there a motion on the uh, consent agenda yes move to approve the consent agenda as presented second second Anything anyone would like to remove? All those in favor? Six zero. Okay, we'll have uh, Ms. Drummy's report. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Great. <laughs> so, November, as always, a very busy time around high school. Students have been involved in a lot of activities. So, first off, we have the musical, which is Chicago. So, opening night is this Friday, November 8th. The show also runs this Saturday and Sunday, which is November 9th and 10th, and next Friday, Saturday and Sunday, which is November 16th through the 18th. Chicago is a 1920s jazz musical centering around two murderesses um, who end up in the Cook County Jail. Both have aspirations of being stars. So you may have seen the movie or you may have seen the musical, but it's a classic musical and the students, both in cast and in crew, have been working so hard, so it would mean a lot if people could come to the show, as always. <laughs> Additionally, in terms of sports, we have the varsity football became Middlesex League champions. The girls swim also are now Middlesex League champions. Cheerleading is moving to the next round in their competition, and then the cross country has made sectionals. Tomorrow, we have a Veterans Day ceremony. So before school, Student Council has arranged a Veterans Day ceremony where they're going to honor various members of the Reading community who have served in combat. So that's taking place before school tomorrow, right outside the high school. And then lastly, we have something pretty interesting. It's this new app called Saturn. So senior Autumn Hendrickson, she pushed for RMHS to take part in the Saturn app. So this is an app that students can download and basically it will show them their schedule. It allows them to share their school schedule with other people, see scheduling updates, and overall it just allows students to be more organized and to be more productive with their use of that's been a fun technological advancement to RMHS recently. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, I'm gonna do an intro and then turn it over to you. Thank you. As Mr. Robinson stated earlier, uh, last November town meeting approved funding for the uh, elementary space and enrollment study. So over the last several months, uh, Dale Geenap from Geenap Associates and his team have been uh, taking tours of the schools, looking at, uh, they hired NESDAC as a subcontractor to do the enrollment report, um, and really have been taking a look at all of the different space needs uh, throughout our elementary schools. And also included in this is a look at the preschool needs, not only for now, but into the, into the future. So we have also, as part of this, um, when we have had regular updates from, from Dale, we've, we've been also including the town manager and Patrick Tompkins uh, as part of the feedback. Patrick is the chair of the, uh, the uh, 
PBC is the uh, building, the permanent building committee. Um, so they have also been weighing in and, and giving input as well. So what you are seeing this evening is um, the first piece of the study. You're seeing the enrollment piece. You're seeing the, the actually elementary space piece with several different schemes or options um, that have been vetted out and are available for recommendations. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dale, and he's going to start the presentation. I would also ask if we hold the questions till the end. Okay. Thank uh, you, Dale. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Um, I'll walk through, I, I think there's a lot of information, so I'll try to be succinct and we can back up and spend time on whatever points that you would like to drill down to. Uh, quickly, I would like to just kind of go through, real review the purpose, provide you some background, the information that we had for starting, existing conditions in terms of the available program space in the schools, enrollment planning options, and, and talk about what we have really had as findings and uh, what the next steps would be for the school and the town. The overall purpose is to really determine what your space needs are and this one, okay, is that better, closer, closer, okay. I promise not to break into song, okay. Um, do the so the real the real key thing is what is needed for space in the schools and so there's a couple of components to that one is obviously planning for enrollment increases um, and so we have to look at what the projected enrollment is so we'll talk about that very briefly uh, and develop multiple planning options for the town generally when we think about planning uh, for a master plan like this you really want to have your vision to be thinking 50 years and beyond just as the complex that we're in now uh, in the whole, with the fields and all of the schools is you know, really a 100-year vision, uh, and uh, 20 years is not very long. But at the same time planning, you wouldn't want to build a building that you don't need the space in for 40 years. So that's really kind of the timeline, and it's consistent with the MSBA goals, um, which is not on that slide, but obviously thinking about the MSBA requirements and guidelines as a standard. And, potential for reimbursement. Um, and then while this is really an elementary school study, is acknowledging that the pre-K is an element uh, that occupies space in the schools and needs to be dealt with. Your enrollment is actually uh, fairly modest increases. Um, across the district, we'll, we'll look at the numbers, um, but uh, your current enrollment is around 800, 1854. Now, this is basically, the MSBA statistical, it's about a year old. At opening of school, you, I think, were right around 1,901 students. So these numbers are a little bit lower than probably the reality. Um, but before you move into a new building, you'll have plenty of time to update that a little bit. So um, there is um, some growth distribution. And I'll talk in just a minute about exactly where those are, but mostly geographically in the center of the north and south of the school of uptown. Whoops. Um, I won't really pause here, it just maybe for people not in the room, that there are the five elementary schools. And this sort of diagram, these are all at the same scale of the size of the school and the site. And we'll just kind of keep referring back to that. And they're color coded a little bit there with the district, which you're familiar with. And of course, one of the considerations is the districts for the middle schools that runs roughly horizontal across the middle of the map. Um, and that's always a consideration just as you think about planning options and how the kids move through the system. So the enrollment across the top is essentially the uh, statistical planning of the enrollment and the projected enrollment. The bottom line is what to kind of draw attention to. So Killam School, um, is projected to have an increase of 60 students and Birch Meadow 33 students. Uh, Wood End, you can see at three students is sort of, you know, a, a, no, a no change situation and a little bit less at Borrows and Eaton. So a total of 115 students. So across the system, that's not a lot compared to what some towns have, um, but it is about 6%. And if you think about the class size for K-5, that's at least, a, you know, six classrooms. and so at least one classroom in every school. Uh, for program standards, I'll talk more about this in a minute, but we do look at the MSBA standards. Um, for your schools are all around 400 students, more or less. 
So it varies by size of school, but the MSB goals are essentially around 160 square feet per student for an elementary school. Um, I will say, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, but um, if you take sort of a random sampling of many elementary schools in Massachusetts over the last three years, uh, they run more like 190 square feet per student, so quite a bit bigger. But we have used this number to talk about. Your, I'll show you the average in one, in one second, but the difference there amounts to around 42,000 square feet just for program, for the existing enrollment, no enrollment increase. Um, to put perspective on that, most of your schools are around 50 to 60,000 square feet, so it's two-thirds or three-quarters of a school building is, is sort of how that plays out. Um, across the top here, if you look at enrollment, now when we look at the capacities of the schools and think about the space, we do not count modular units uh, because, you know, in a 50-year vision, those are really not a long-term solution. They, they serve a short-term needs, but that's consistent with, with school planning. So you can see across the bottom here, square feet per student, um, kill them at 140 versus sort of a standard at 160. Um, Birch Meadow at 127 and over to the right Josh Eaton at 129. That explains a little bit why you needed modular buildings at Eaton um, and it explains why you're feeling the pressure at Birch Meadow that you're going to talk about later tonight I guess. Um, we in that number to the right and an average of 137 we did not include Wood End. Wood End has 196 so as I say that's actually over the kind of recommended but it is, in fact, on par with what r many recent schools are, are being built. And um, just real quickly, if you took districts that are building a new school that are at the 190, probably not, not all of their schools are at that size. But the most recent buildings, as you know, tend to have maybe performance space, auditoriums, that kind of thing that pushes that number up. But it tends to be shared across the building. So um, Wood End is not um, out of line at all with things that have been done. Um, the one, if you put Wood End, end into the arithmetic, it's at, it's at 146. For pre-K, uh, you currently have 110 pre-K students. Um, mostly at the high school. Uh, the projections for that are a little more difficult um, just because you can do birth rates, but it's, since it doesn't, not everybody in town, birth rate flows into the system and, you know, it's a different mix. Um, we're projecting 175 students. That's what we've used for planning. You currently have eight classrooms of pre-K. 175 gives you 13. Um, at you know with the class size that you're looking for so again that number is a little bit malleable um, but that seems to be a reasonable planning number to use uh, proportionally if you go back to the 115 for k5 that's like 20 students per grade you know this is 65 per grade so it is a much more uh, dramatic increase um, than has been done. We, this is a chart, I don't know, Dr. Dory, if you want to talk about this at all or- So we showed this the the, at the last meeting when we were discussing the modulars. It, it shows that really the programmatic needs have changed significantly since 2005 in three areas. Your full day kindergarten has increased and as I said, we're about at 90% capacity right now for full day kindergarten. Our special education programs, um, where we had one in 2005 is we're now up to nine with a tenth one for next year um, at Birch Meadow. And then the Rise Preschool has steadily grown from five to now uh, eight, um, as Dale had said earlier. And it sort of follows that over time you have 14 uh, full day kindergarten classrooms that probably your pre-K is gonna catch up to that as things continue to evolve with the program. Um, the overall, the, just as a kind of base, this is again the diagram of the five schools um, on their sites and their relative size, and we'll walk through um, how that is. Killam School, so the current enrollment um, around 419. So capacity for elementary schools, you have to look at them two ways. Uh, one simple way used to be is to take the number of classrooms and think about your class size, divide it into it, and that kind of gave you the capacity of the school. 
Um, when you're planning, a few things happen. Um, one is there is also this 160 square feet, so that depends on the core size. Um, so Killam as a for instance, the gym is very small compared to the rest of the school, and so different formulas come in. So the capacity of 412, as we've shown it there, is basically taking the classroom count minus um, roughly three and a half classroom equivalents uh, for SPED programs that have to be set aside, excluding the core facilities and so on. So that number ends up to be larger than would be if you divided the area of the building by the 160. So this always gets into a little bit of funny math of exactly where, you know, the capacity is. Um, this diagram, I'll walk through each one quickly. So if you take the current enrollment and take that uh, deficit of roughly 23 square feet per student, just for program space, uh, ignoring enrollment growth, uh, the orange block there gives you um, a sense of how much extra space would be needed in the school. So again, you do have two modulars there that are sort of shown, you know, under that orange block. Then if you take what the projected growth is with no redistricting, just the projected growth, the yellow gives you an, an idea of what additional space would be required to handle the enrollment increase. And it's, it's fairly simil similar for all of the buildings. Um, at Barrows uh, or at Birch, um, again, a similar sort of relationship. You know, these things run around 10%. Wood end, um, again, there is no uh, additional space needed on the square foot per student. It already has that. Um, and there is a tiny projected enrollment of three students, which no child is insignificant, but statistically that's insignificant. Um, Barrows, again, since you have the modulars, um, less less growth, but again on a square foot basis that there is a, a need there. And you know, what does that mean? It means over time to provide those programs, you have to reduce the enrollment in those, in those schools and it takes some level of renovation. Um, and Josh Eaton, again, it's less growth, um, but as we saw on that earlier number, you're around 129 square feet, so that and Birch Meadow are ones, and, and you feel the pressure with the program in those buildings. Um, so some of the, so the next step really looking at what are some planning options. So what are the constraints that we're working with? Um, and all of these are basically good summaries and goals, but everything is, uh, you know, subject to consideration. We, we didn't start out with, you know, any preconceived notions. We looked at the buildings, just tried to look at the sites. Um, your buildings are all, you know, when we think about existing conditions, there's two things, you know, does, does the roof leak and then what's the program space? So this is about the program space. The buildings are all well maintained. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, Eaton is the oldest building unrenovated. Um, it, it has really been not significantly changed since 1969 when it was constructed. The other buildings have been upgraded since around 2005 to 2012. You meant um, kill them, right? Kill I'm sorry, kill them. Did I? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, you know, we took we took into account the limitations of the current districts. Again, uh, you're probably not going to send Eaton kids to to Wood End just, you know, for a number of reasons, location-wise, the cycle of building renovation needs. But again, we're really looking at a longer-term plan. The exact physical facilities are not such a major factor in this as the ability of the site to be shaped and, and, and the building to be able to adapt it to what your program needs are. Um, and keeping awareness of the middle school zoning. Again, less, less of a driver than some other things. Um, Wood End, we looked at as, you know, as, as being difficult to expand. There is some land there available. To, as we're looking at the plan towards the bottom, um, is not very buildable. There's a steep slope on that area. Um, there is a, the playground to the top of the sheet um, on the right side of the parking. So the constraint here is, um, is less, uh, less about the land area than road access. Um, from the south, there is, there is access and I, um, if I can make the, the, the rotary to the entrance there, on this, on the, I guess that is actually the south too, now just the way we're looking at it. But on the north, 
actually the way most people would arrive is actually a private road through that area. So the, the route actually to the school is very secure. It's just around uh, that end of town. Um, and it's not where the population is. So the difficulty there, the, the, the site constraints just from a practical standpoint seem a little more access than, than available on site. But that is, uh, uh, you know, a possibility. Um, this is the one school, as I say, that has the area uh, per student that's desired. Um, again, some of, we, we, we just know from experience that it's not practical to do a project at every site. Um, but that will not be cost effective and, and uh, be very disruptive. Um, also, Josh Eaton, um, because of the configuration of the site, um, in a few things, the front access, the historical building on the street, and the two pinches on the site there would make it difficult to do a major uh, project or increase there. Um, the only option would probably be to do some significant removal of the building in order to get access back and lose the two fields. So that's a consideration of, um, you know, kind of inhibiting it being an ideal location for development. Borrows the same way the, um, the wetland area there shown in red in the setback. Uh, the topography, as you know, slopes off. Um, again, this, this site's pretty heavily utilized, plus the community access and neighborhood and all of that would be difficult to increase the enrollment dramatically. Um, so with all of that, um, we tried to look at, you know, what are the options? Uh, the assumptions, we assume, you know, the pre-K at the high school is not a good long-term solution, that ideally it should be addressed, but I guess specifically under the, you know, this study, it would not have to be, but it leaves a hanging question. Uh, as I mentioned, we assumed 175 students. Modular classrooms are good short term, but we're assuming they're not part of the capacity of the schools long term. Um, they're also, by the way, not eligible for reimbursement, if you think about that in terms of a MSBA. We're assuming redistricting at some level would be acceptable. Um, and that would have to be done in terms of the middle school. We have not tried to figure out what that would be for these schemes, but knowing it would be something. Um, we know, you know, generically there would be an interest usually in downsizing from five sites to four sites. We did look at that, um, and we'll talk about it. And then again, these, when we show these, these are not designs, like if we show a, a block, we're not necessarily saying add the building there, but just, you know, contextually can, you know, can it work? And we did a cost, uh, this is 2019 dollars based on square foot cost um, and a markup for project cost. Uh, I mentioned about um, not being able to expand. We did look at all the buildings and consider whether we could add a second floor. Um, there are small areas that that maybe could be done, but there's, it's not really possible to add a significant area to any of the buildings get access there and it also is very difficult phasing wise because you really couldn't occupy the school during that. Um, we considered, you know, because there is an increase of 115 students plus say roughly 40 some thousand square feet of space, just redistricting cannot solve the problem. Um, and we also considered briefly at least whether, you know, is there space to move the fifth grade, say, to the middle school. And there's, you know, the middle schools seem to be okay to handle what's coming through the elementary schools but couldn't absorb an additional grade. That would just uh, divert the problem to there, if you would. Um, and then also, you know, additional staff and the separation. Um, so th this was, I guess, um, briefly, it would take an additional classrooms at Parker, 10 additional classrooms and eight at Coolidge if we tried to just do it uh, by putting the fifth grade there. And we really didn't go far enough. It would also start impacting the core facilities. Suddenly you need a third teaching station for the gym and so on. It becomes kind of an impractical. So we went through and we used this kind of monopoly house diagram to understand. Um, so walk you through this this scheme a um, is just a strategy to try to solve um, the problem at the Killam site now rather than repeat it over and over uh, but I will say a couple times 
the three schools on the site were Eaton on the right side, that's what I meant to say, Eaton, we don't really think we can do a, a significant project there. Um, and borrows the same thing because of the site constraint. Wood end, we still keep on the table because there is some land there at the site. So it starts putting the pressure to solve this problem on Killam and Birch Meadow. Um, and there's advantages in different. Now we've shown here just for to have some sense of the math, uh, you know, we're not necessarily really saying the district changes for 30 kids, you know, from Eaton to Killam, but somehow you have to, in these scenarios, we would have to redistrict to provide some reduction in the enrollment there. How that plays out would be determined. So um, this is one scenario. This does not address pre-K. This would leave pre-K here at the high school um, and not have a good long-term solution. Another scenario um, that we looked at to, to, is to take and put the two-story um, school at Killam. Uh, we feel we could build a new school there um, while the existing one is occupied or at least a significant portion. So it helps with the phasing problem. Um, and we will, uh, we did consider, you know, just doing at Killam, but the enrollment really becomes too great. Uh, so by doing a second project at Birch Meadow, and again, that's not necessarily the design for, say, an addition and renovation, but by doing a second project there, we could keep the Killam enrollment to around 660 students. Um, and the other schools end up being like they are now, around 400 students. Um, it's worth just noting there is a little bit of a magic spot around 600 to 650 students for an elementary school is sort of what one core facility can accommodate. When you get over that, you sort of need that third teaching station for the gym. The cafeteria starts having to be, it's hard to make it work with three, the scheduling for three seatings and so on. So that, um, so that's one of the, a little bit, the goals um, for trying to do that and keep, and keep killing. Um, we did look at a possible renovation. Um, I'm not quite convinced we could do that at Killam, uh, and it would have real phasing problems, but again, just to have looked at it uh, to try to, now the reason the Killam shows there a piece of it yellow is the core facilities are undersized, in particular the gym. So the thought would be to take a portion of the building down, improve the core facilities, but still utilize the classrooms, which is really the best asset of that building. Knowing there's some handicapped accessibility things with the pits and so on, but the classrooms are more generous sized and windows and all kinds of things that are um, somewhat advantageous. And this also would require redistricting. Again, it, this would not address the pre-K. So um, another scheme that we looked at brings wood end back into it. There was uh, consideration about trying to do uh, the four, the four sites, and it was kind of our last expectation um, that Birch would be the one that w you would drop out if you did anything. But um, partly the siting of Killam, I mean, it's not geographically in the center of town. It is north and south, but sort of population-wise, it's more central um, than 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 say Wood End or or Eaton. Um, and then when you start looking at how it would district, um, it makes sense that you would have the other schools rather than the Birch Meadow site. Killam has a, big, a bigger site. This, it just becomes too much uh, pressure on uh, the Killam site, but, but really on Wood End again because of the access issue, which is something that could still be considered, but it did not seem as you know, one of the most advantageous. Um, this option G, so this was an attempt, again, to try to get to a four-site uh, project and, and address the pre-K. And you can see um, it, it means that Killam would be a 750-student elementary school. And that's kind of a shocking thing to hear or say. We do actually see a number of schools coming through MSBA at that size and including up to 900. I'm not advocating for it, I'm just saying you wouldn't be alone. Um, it probably, 
um, and Dr. Doherty ran some numbers, it doesn't seem it really ends up being a big operational savings that one might expect because when you get that big, you tend to have a principal for each. Those schools tend to be designed with a core facility and more or less act like two separate schools flanking the, the shared core facilities. So there is some savings perhaps in the core facilities like the kitchen and so on, but you still need enough space for all the kids to eat. You still need enough gym stations and so there's a, there's a small amount. Operationally you still have really the same number of staff and, and teachers. There might be savings of an, say one nurse or something, but um, it becomes uh, but that would be a consideration by putting um, some uh, addition or so on wood end without dramatically increasing the intensity of that site uh, would provide uh, some relief to that. But again, it's, it's two projects and, and it leaves Birch Meadow and uh, I guess to what advantage. Um, one consideration that had been floating around before in town was do you do an early pre-K, you know, an early childhood center that could either be a K, a pre-K one or a pre-K two to try to bring uh, the enrollment back down on Killam. It would kind of lead you back to doing that at Birch Meadow because there's no place else to put it. And then you're back to five sites and it kind of just has an escalated cost, you know, to redo all the Birch Meadow. So financially, that does not seem advantageous. Um, one of the things that, you know, as we go through all of these schemes, and I'll, and I'll back up and summarize a little bit, but it, it did turn out to kill them, kept coming up as a solution for, for many of the reasons I said at the beginning. Um, it, the site is large enough to handle it. Whether there would be access off Haverhill Street is a question. Um, that's a busy road and so on, but it has the opportunity for some better access than some of the other sites. Um, and it, it, it does need an upgrade, but I'll say that's more of a happy coincidence than, you know, a design goal or something we set out to do because for the reasons we said, it's really a longer term view of that and, and the assets. Um, but it, if it did get renovated, it sort of avoids that cost. It, it is the, it was built in 69 and has has really not, it, it's been touched, it's, it's been well maintained, but it's kind of life cycle um, issues. So, you know, overall conclusions, you know, um, we did look, and this, I should have probably mentioned some of these before, but I mean, we did consider, you know, do you rent space? That's really not a good investment strategy for a municipality. Um, we cannot totally redistrict, you know, we cannot, um, it's not practicable to do an addition at every building, so it means some level of redistricting. Um, and really, Wood End is somewhat up for as a candidate for an expansion, but primarily leaves Birch Meadow and Killam as the two sites uh, that seem to be the best resources to help address the, the problem. And if we try to do only at one site, um, seems to be an extraordinarily, well, that's the wrong word, but too big a school or larger than, than you're on the path, like a 750 elementary school. So by working on two sites, you probably capture the efficiency of one school at around 650 and the other schools would stay at around 400 with moving some things. But you do need, um, there would be some redistricting over time also to provide some of this increased space for core facilities and program space that you need. Um, I don't know if, if you want to go back and the, well, the last thing I want to talk about is a little bit sort of next steps and so on, but um, I don't know if you, you want to yeah, pause well, here to finish that and then we can. Okay. So the, um, again, anticipating, you know, hoping to be in the MSBA process, um, and I always hate when presenters say this. I know you can't read this, but I'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is there's, there's three rows here of this flow chart. The top one being preparation. Uh, the second one being says scope and the bottom being and scope monitoring. What it really is is planning, preliminary design and construction. It's essentially what's there. We are up in that little blue box up above um, that 
And so the next step that, that you would do if you were pursuing an SBA would be to, with MSBA, is to file a letter of interest. And the letter of interest is really, um, they're looking for two, two key things. Uh, what is it you want to do? What you, what's your plan? What's your long-term master plan? And if it includes more than one project, what is your priority project? Um, that is the key thing. When you submit that, uh, they take around, it's, a, it's about a 30-day to 60-day process that they will review. And, you know, I think the words they use is, you know, to validate you know, the request and the findings by the community. Um, so during that, they may ask for additional data. Uh, they want to understand enrollment projections. You know, it's, it's almost basically all these things we've just done. That's, that's why we've been here to do that, is to prepare you for that. Um, so if you um, meet their requirements, if, if it's sort of accepted, if you will, from the letter of interest, you go to this next step, which they refer to as ICC. Um, the um, certification is basically you sign a contract with them that you understand your obligations to move into the next phase, and that puts you on a on a group of tasks, um, which is the eligibility period, um, of which you have 270 days. And I'll kind of back up once more. The right column there, you see those, those top two charts, there's a check mark. Basically, that's where you have to provide funding. You have to develop. So the top bar is essentially getting to a point where you know what you're going to do and you're willing to fund a feasibility study and schematic design. Uh, then you would go to the second bar where you really do preliminary design, design development, um, and get to a point where you know what it's going to cost and, and all of those pieces. And at that point, you have to fund at least final design. You might find, fund final design and the construction cost. Most towns fund the final design and come back later and fund the construction cost. Um, but there is a, a significant um, element there because, the, truthfully, there are... Um, many communities applying for the same money and i think i'll be more blunt than maybe msba would be i think they don't want to spend time and tie up the money if a community is not willing to fund the actual construction and just do the planning and meanwhile some other community who may have funded the, the construction uh misses their opportunity so once you enter that system there you know there are some checkpoints and commitments <coughs> For you specifically, um, the, the, the point would be for the town to submit the letter of interest. And I think, you know, not to speak for town protocol, but I think basically that would mean the school committee making a decision of what recommendation you want to do and the town making a decision of what strategy you want to do and what your priority project is to submit the letter of intent. Um, or letter of interest, um, that would then enter into this 270-day period where essentially um, there, there is a lot of legwork at that point of providing records for what maintenance you have done on the buildings, projections for maintenance for the other buildings, validating the enrollment projections. So that's one of those points where I said that you would do another more detailed look at the enrollment projections. Um, but you're going to, you know, what we have done, NESDEC has done with us, satisfies the basic requirement to do the letter of interest to, you know, because part of um, what will happen during that and then the feasibility study <coughs> is what exactly, you know, would be the shifts in enrollment. Because right now we have an idea of what size school might be built or a renovation. But that would get refined during that process as you as you sort of hone that planning option. Um, and again, this and um, so this, I can explain to you why this is right, and I can explain to you why it's wrong. But you know, generically, you know, you're three to four years, you know, at least 
before you're moving into this building. There is this 270 day period that really gets you to uh, really understanding what you're doing, the feasibility study, and making a big, huge financial commitment to going the next step. Um, you during that 150, you know, hiring an OPM and a project designer. Um, that first part during eligibility, a lot of that is done by the town in terms of maintenance records and so on. Usually the town hires someone, you know, like us, like we're doing now to assist with those tasks. Um, then the feasibility study. Again, these are um, the maximum time they allow in the program. So you have to make a commitment to move along. But, you know, you may, you could probably do the feasibility study for this project in less than 300 days. This is their standard. If you were trying to reconsolidate two high schools into one, <laughs> it may take that kind of time. Um, you know, schematic design project, you know, final design of year construction, you know, more or less by the time you do groundbreaking, furniture and so on. Again, you, that's kind of a time frame. This project, if it's one elementary school, is a little bit smaller, you can probably move a little bit faster than that. But that's a, a broad brush. Um, the letter of interest period will open uh, in January, and you'll probably it'll probably be January into mid February or so that that will be open. So, if it's this year, that's a bit of a timeline for that. Um, and with that, I'll try to field any questions. Any questions from the committee? Back to this particular stage. Um, thinking of just starting here, there's probably a lot to talk about from before, but the, the 270 days, is that hard and fast? I'm trying to think of the timing. If we file January 1st, our next town meeting, for example, isn't next until next November, and the funding is at the end of that 27, the second, next funding question is at the end of that 270 days, which would put us at the end of September, as yeah. opposed to the middle of November. So. Short answer is yes. <laughs> There, the, and that and that does become difficult for some towns. It usually takes a special meeting and so on. And uh, that that is a very um, busy time by a lot of um, town boards and efforts and building consensus and funding. Um, the, the architect problem tends to start in the next phase, but that is that is a that is a difficult task. Just to add on to that, does the 270 start after they accept our, our proposal or after we, when we initially send the letter in? No, you do the letter of interest yep. and they'll review and then there is a little process of um, the cert compliant, it's uh, the statement of its uh, certification compliance. It's basically a contract that you signed that you understand what your obligations will be. Mm -hmm. um, and when you sign that, um, you got, that that starts the clock for the clock starts. Yeah. So it, but it, you could almost say 300 days backing up from when they uh, positively react to the um, letter of interest because you can't just you know delay on that for a long time there's you know they have many applicants so it's sort of like okay if we're going to go forward if you're a selected town you know you kind of that they anticipate that certification compliance contract uh, to be a 30-day process. What's the shelf life of this report? Of uh, what we've done? Uh, probably two to three years or so. Yes. Um, so I want to preface this question. You should, yeah, speak to both. I want to preface this question with just my awareness that we currently are out of space. We currently have modulars at three schools. We're working towards getting three more modular classrooms. So I, I want to preface it that I fully understand that the need behind this is predominantly programmatic and they're already at past capacity. So that's my preface. Um, but there is a little bit of an enrollment bump plan anticipated at Kellam and Birch Meadow. And I, the reason I preface is I know that's not the driver, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if you can speak to your methodology for those enrollment predictions and what is driving the en enrollment, the small enrollment increases you're anticipating there versus the other three schools. Right. So I, I will try to explain it, but 
typically we would have a whole separate presentation on enrollment projections that somebody else would be talking of. That's why we hire NESDEC. So it's really a statistical work. But some of the things that they do is they look at uh, births um, and then they look at housing sales and trends moving into town. Um, and then populations is actually done by school district. So we did, they did go through by district and look at both births, um, housing starts, which does apply to part of you, but more it's, it's housing turnover. And that's the problem a lot of communities are having. The aging population is, you know, going to the condos, new families are coming in and, you know, homes that have had two people for 30 years now have, you know, three kids in them. And, or whatever so they did look at that they look at building permits um, that are being issued um, and beyond it's that it's black magic that I'd have to have NESDEC talk to specifically and I think um, to add on to that a little bit as part of the NESDEC process they did reach out they did we gave them names of several realtors in town they also met with the assistant town manager to get information on permits and housing so they did do some outreach as well so it we tried to be as all-encompassing but again it is you can't 100 percent predict who's moving in and out but they did do outreach to gain as much information as they could and here like many places it's the conversion of single-family homes to multi-family you know higher density and that's really why it's happening say at Killam versus would end that kind of redevelopment is not happening at this point you know so dale you mentioned uh earlier in the presentation that we're or actually it's in here 160 square feet per student mm -hmm. and you said that that usually runs at 190. the recent uh, many of the recent elementary and schools yeah what are we losing by being at 160 versus 190 uh, well you probably things like um, auditoriums or better presentation type spaces um, classrooms uh, size of classrooms um, and um, maybe some things like like this space you know is a community use space but does not really have to be this big just for the school so providing some features like that and that's why we find um, that the more recent schools tend to be bigger and those things are provided, but they're not necessarily in every school in the district like you that has that have five elementary schools. Um, so that's what tends to happen. Now, much of that, if it's built into the program, is uh, reimbursable through MSBA, and then certain improvements are not. But But many towns just you know, vote to do those, provide those facilities. And you don't see that with with technology going the other way? I mean, look at the, I mean, this was built for books. I mean, you, you uh, Right, yeah. right. Well, and the library is always the, the tough thing, but there are so many other uh, program things that, that happen, like Makerspace, you know, and STEM labs, and those kinds of things that start, that start eating that up, and, um, you know, computer, computer equipment and printers and 3D printers, all of that kind of stuff tends to, to take that up. So the library is the one thing that maybe compresses, but, um, and I, I always hate to make it sound like it's just a, a special education problem, but that does take space. But also other, you know, other facilities for kids. I mean, uh, there's different alternatives for uh, performance and interacting and that kind of thing, as well as, um, you know, alternative uh, physical education facilities, you know, rock climbing, you know, ropes courses, or, you know, those kinds of things that uh, the programs keep increasing. Yes, Dr. Dr. Um, can you use the, the USB? Oh. and you're gonna have to use the other one also. It was short, um, yeah. Thank you very much for all this work and for the presentation. It's very informative. When I'm looking at the timeline 
I'm knowing that there are other things that are going to be involved in this process, and I'm wondering where they fit. Like, when we think about doing a building project, we're going to need to probably talk about a debt exclusion or a um, financing. And does that have to come, does that come before the town votes at town meeting to say we'll do this project, or does it come during those 300 days after the feasibility? What, how how much a, in promise do they need? Well, and in that earlier period, in that 270 and 150 there, really during that 270, you would have to fund essentially hiring the designer and the, and the project manager for the first, I'll call it, half of the design work. Um, so that's that's a significant portion that is is in that 270, um, but that has to happen, and then it's after the feasibility study. Um, during that 300 days, you would do the feasibility study and a schematic design, um, and then at that point is when you would have to make a commitment to go to, to the finish line for the construction. So that's like in the second year, if you will. Thank you. And if we've made the commitment to fund this, but then during those 300 days, we don't manage to pass that funding, will the SBA, I know they have other people in line, will we be put in a special park, would we be put in a special parking lot or we'd lose our place you or? Back, you go back to the next year's review of priorities. Start all over. Start all over Start from over. the beginning. Yeah. One of the things I'm noticing on the, the study is the drop in high school students year over year. Mm -hmm. Do you know how that was calculated when we're looking at increases K-8? Yeah, there, there is a loss. Of, I, I did know that number at one point. I think it was around 40 students that lose um, from eighth grade to ninth grade to go to private schools or other districts and so on. So that's, that is a tendency to happen. That, and that's, that's happened, that's been pretty consistent for a long time. And, and John, if I can add to that, what, um, right now we're at the low point for elementary yep. enrollment. So now we're starting to go up again, but those kids are continuing to move. So that's why your high school enrollment and your middle school and then high school enrollment are gonna start to now decline. So I think that's why you're seeing that as well. But there is just that, that also to go to the tech schools, yeah. Yeah. you lose 15 or so. You, you, can go ahead. you want to just say your name so they can get it for the... Um, Andrew McLaughlin, um, representing FinCom. I just have a quick question about your timeline, kind of hitting on um, uh, losing our turn, so to speak. It says three and a half years, roughly looking at the days. These are obviously overlapping constructs, I would assume, because there's about five years up there on that slide. Mm -hmm. um, two yep. and a half years at the end with another uh, two and a half years going through. Um, the only challenge I see here is because in, in order for a certain process to get approved, there's about six steps involved, <laughs> and, and those all take you know, you'll do one one month, the next month, the next month. Um, so in the matter of 365 days, you may not have that eligibility um, funding just because of where it falls, um, where the town meeting falls. Um, so I, I don't know if there's a, a way to um, somewhat speed that up or post would, that up. We would have a special town meeting probably. Yeah, yeah. Probably make a special town meeting. Right. Okay. Right. <coughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. I have a question, and I know that the focus is definitely more on K-5, but the projected pre-K enrollment is, is extreme. There's a big jump up. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what's driving that? I'm sorry. That I didn't hear what you said. Well, again, it, it's, it's been the trend that's been happening. All right. Just if over... Um, it, although you've only added, um, you've added three classrooms since I think it's 2007, but when you drill into the numbers a little bit more, it's a kind of escalating thing. So it is, it is a bit of a, a leap of faith, as they say. We we don't have a, a real hard, good way of of documenting that. Um, 
and I, I can't talk about it much more I can ask but really NESDAQ has not because you you can't really do it so much from the birth and the, you know the housing starts factor into it but it has primarily been you know a school department uh, monitoring that so it's based more on the historic trend at rise yes and just to piggyback on that the, the historic trend is also based on the increase in the number of students that uh, are on IEPs which means then you have to also increase your number of and I hate using this word but typicals yeah. That's the, I know that's the word that they use, the number of typicals to make sure you have at least the 51-49 ratio. Yep. That I see. So if the increases in special education, there's an exponential component. Dale, Dale, did you happen to calculate what, by including the modulars that we have now and, and potentially we've asked for, we're going to ask for three more, what that would bring the square footage per student down to? Um, I didn't, you're, you, roughly you have, a, those are. Um, or up to, I should the, say. The kindergarten ones are a little bit bigger, but I think if you use an average of about 900 um, square feet per, so you have um, per classroom, so you have six now, we're talking about adding yeah. the other three, so you know, it's, it's not a staggering number really. If you if you have six at 900 5,000 square feet mm -hmm. compared to five schools at roughly 5,000 250,000 so it's a fairly small element any other questions? yes um, in the assumptions a couple places you talked about the impact on the middle schools so any redistricting is going to have an impact on who goes to Parker and who goes to Florida and I know I'm asking you like so far in advance of what we're So I'll ask it broadly. What's your level of confidence that that's a surmountable problem? If we fundamentally change where elementary kids are in district, uh, depending on a lot of these mm -hmm. things, which a larger kill means that, right? Yeah. Um, how confident are you that that's a problem we can solve that is <coughs> equitable and fair and reasonable? Yeah, I'm quite confident. I mean, it happens in pretty much every community that has to do a new school. Not, obviously not all, but, um, and you don't have a completely clean split now. Right? Killam, mean, Killam, Killam is the split school. Yeah. <coughs> it could be just taking a look at Killam and splitting it differently. In a different way. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Y. Um, when you were mentioning the MSBA stuff a little while ago, you were saying how c communities add on space in some cases, and MSBA may not fund that portion. If if this community was interested in adding on something else, so it's not just a school, but something else, what are the MSBA-related restrictions and, and, ref and amount that they would contribute, or wh when would we become not eligible for MSBA because we made it something bigger than just a school? Um, basically, it would be at your own cost. The whole thing? Yes. So is there, so is there a- MSBA, for instance, doesn't fund superintendent administrative offices. Um, you know principals and things within the school obviously but but and uh, field houses you know you can provide educational space but the field house portion if you do that kind of thing that's beyond the educational program is, is at your own cost and there's there is a, you know there's a very specific worksheet that you go through during all the steps of the project that sort of have the eligibility and what's not eligible uh, site work is not and this is a little, a little off the topic that you're doing, but you know, like contamination on sites is not, you know, reimbursable. But really, it really is what is the educational program, and those. I mean, that's kind of a simplistic answer, but I think relevant. So, just as a point of clarification, if we built a, a building, say, I'm just going to say a, a, a nice round number. It's too small, but we'll say, you know. 50,000 square feet. We know it's going to be more. Mm -hmm. But of that square footage, 30,000 was for education and 20,000 was for something else. Would they fund a portion none of, of the 30,000? They would 000? fund none of that. None of that. Right. So is there a limit by which when you start adding additional square footage of something that you just don't fund the project at all? Well, no. It, it could be, um, I, th I think basically um, you could attach some other program. It's not, they don't prohibit there being 
you know, a building connected to it, but they wouldn't contribute to any of the cost that's related to that non-school function. So then that, in that case, it wouldn't, they wouldn't contribute to the 20000 but they could still contribute to the 30000 Yes, yeah. It's around, it's about 650. Um, if you, 600 fits comfortably, 650 starts me, but there, you know, if, if you look around communities, you know, one gym, you know, played cross court, gives you two teaching stations that handles 600 elementary school. You know, one library, typical size, one computer lab in the library, all of that sort of, and it, ju it just builds out of scheduling, um, that that's kind of where that comes to. I, I think that this is a detail that maybe you can't answer, but in your estimates for the projects, is that an estimate for buildings that have air conditioning for our students and teachers, or is that like an extra detail that would then be added above it's, that, just in a, your figuring your estimates? Yeah, so we, we used a square foot cost based on, you know, kind of what we see recent schools coming in. It would certainly include air conditioning and all the core spaces, and depending on some quality factors and so on, it may well include the air conditioning in the classrooms. Um, we do see schools in those costs, but again, everything becomes a trade-off, and there is sort of a maximum cost that's eligible for reimbursement. But Thank you. We do, I mean, some of the answer to that is most of the schools we see coming through are air conditioned in the classrooms now. So um, I'm going to go back a little bit to the pre-K growth numbers. Did we consider whether or not, and we end tying this to the rental conversation, we don't want to rent space for school space, right? But somewhat to the point of MSBA wouldn't, wouldn't pay for administrative space. Do we consider whether or not if we rented administrative space somewhere else and we used the existing administrative space for the pre-K growth, if that was a possibility? No, they're not. They're not really. Um, I got to think <laughs> the way you. It pre, the pre-K space would be eligible for reimbursement. They they will not pay any rental or anything. Obviously. I guess where I was going with was with, with the growth. Could we accomplish the growth and, and handle the growth in our existing building here? Yeah. By potentially freeing up that space yeah. and renting for non edu non yeah. and not, I can't say non-educational because they're very educational, yeah. but yeah. non-teaching, non-classroom space. Well, I mean, you could go rent space and you could help. Uh, I guess probably maybe the answer is the superintendent's area would probably provide two, maybe two three to classrooms. three. Yeah. So, you know, roughly 15 kids per classroom, so maybe it would accommodate 30 of the 65 or something. Be, as you've been down in the, the large conference room there, has no windows access and all of that, so you'd only get about, I'm guessing you'd only get two rooms in there, two pre-K rooms. Okay. Yeah. Can I just piggyback to that? Yeah. So one of the things, and I, I can go into more detail, one of the things that we looked at too was operating costs. And anytime you rent space, that would be a hit to your operating budget, um, which means then that something else is going to need to be taken away. So it's just something to consider. And we were looking at that throughout all of these schemes is what's going to be the impact of the operating budget. So we looked at busing. We looked at utility costs. We looked at additional staffing that may be needed or may not be needed depending on the scheme. So. We tried to look at that angle as well because I know that is something that um, the community is going to look at. And ironically, as Dale said, when you go to four schools, you don't save a lot. You may save a, save a position or two, but you don't save a lot in operating costs um, because you're adding square footage to other buildings, which keeps your utility costs at about the same, although there'll be some savings with new technology and, and things like that. Um, but essentially, everyone that was in that building gets 
redeployed to the other buildings. And with larger schools, you need more administrative staff. Uh, you can't run a school of 650 students with one principal. It's just not realistic. Yes, they, the, if you will, the requirement for the letter of interest is what your priority projects. You can only, you can only apply for one project at a time. But w wouldn't this be one overall project? Well, I'm, I'm saying, like, like, just to pick an example, you would submit that your intention is to, you know, do something at the Killam site and something at Birch Meadow. That's your master plan, um, and that your your priority project is to do the birch metal thing. And, that, and that's because whatever it is, you know, enrollment or doing that would accommodate your phasing, you know, and then the next thing you would do would be, you know, whatever the, they wouldn't necessarily press you on, let's say you had five steps, you know, a, a bigger community, to have, you know, they wouldn't necessarily press you on, well, what's gonna be the next one? <laughs> you know, you'll figure that out. But, but what's, the, what's the project you're applying for? You know, they're, they're asking your, in your letter of interest, what's your big plan and what's the project you're, you're applying for to fund? I don't know if we have the same question, yeah. but so is there a scenario where they would approve one part of the project and not another? Or well, is it more just they want to know what the order of them are? No, you're, you're, you would be applying to enter the program for a project, a, a, a site. Well. Right, okay. and when you finish that project, you can come back and apply to do your next increment. Now, there's, and I really think that's their hard rule. Sometimes it have, you know, burgeoning enrollment growth or something, almost have to do two things at once, but they just have to kind of accelerate that. You know? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what, Whatever if we did whatever if we decide on something, it will be a combination of some of these things to get to what we want. So to to then carve out some of it would would throw throw away our whole plan. I mean, we 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 couldn't get half of what we asked for. We'd have to get the whole thing, uh, right? I mean, well, but presumably you would not do at the same time both sites that they're asking you to pick which is the first you know which is the first construction site that you would do the work at so is it more the way they're funding it is that the um well just there's, there's so they're not going to approve and reimburse you for two buildings at one time you you have to do one and come back with your next priority which does a little bit factor into solving it once, <laughs> you know. Yes. I think I think I'm asking the same question just to truly understand. I'm really sorry for the repetition. So if we were to pick, I'm just looking at it. Scheme C. So Scheme C has kill them, gutted, rent it. Well, I don't even want to ask that one. Um, the <laughs> Scheme B. Scheme B. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bias already. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we were to look at Scheme B, so our priority would be the two-story 660 student school on the kill em site. So when we apply with our letter of intent, we're saying, this is our big picture. We're going to do Killam first, then we're going to do Birch Meadow, Correct. the addition to Birch Meadow. And they're going to say, hopefully, yes, go with Killam, and then we're going to need to apply again another time to, for the addition to Birch Meadow. Even though in our scheme it's one plan, Correct. for them it's, a, it's two plans. Correct. And so when I'm thinking, say, Scheme B, um, in terms of our need and enrollment, what's the time frame that you see us being under pressure to get both pieces of that done? Like, do they both need to be done, I was going to say yesterday for the impact, but in five years? Or 
um, on that scheme, if we get kill them in five years, do we have a window of another um, five years before we do Birch Meadow? Because it takes that long for the process. Correct. You, you would likely, um, now I'm going where I shouldn't go, but you, you would likely have an interim plan. So, because st mathematically, um, I mean, you're already pressured at Birch today, right? So we might flip Let it. alone, you know, in five more years. So you would likely devise the whole scenario to do something, say, at Killam site or whatever the other project was to provide you some at least short-term relief of, that prob of the problem at the other school until that was done. And that would be part of the whole, you know, planning of that, of that process. Which is why, as a for instance, you know, um, being able to build a new school before you take the old one down is a, is a, is a critical element, you know. So then before we took the other one down, we might be able to use that for the Birch Meadow plan? Possibly. You know, maybe there's some classrooms that are there. It, again, modulars factor into this, but modulars are not reimbursable. So that's, you know, that's cash down the drain in a way. I mean, it's a, it's a but it, it might be a less costly than some of the other things. But, but that, that is part of what has to happen really that's part of what the feasibility study would do is sort that out and it would help it would also go a long way towards thinking about the the districting issue we know what what's the impact of that how is that going to work so that would help us decide which project would really need to go first if our dire need is at birch meadow then they might suggest that goes first which is Possibly, but they're going. But they're going to look for you to to decide that they're not, they're not and apply for us. what you want. Thank um, you. We're going to beat this horse, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pardon my use of language. Um, so, I think from a dire need perspective, just to go that it seems like our greatest growth is at Killam, and that's going to be the dire need. Presuming we get the modular stuff taken care of at Birch in the next year, give or take. Um, but let me, I think the answer to this is no, but I want to ask it just to make sure. Can we apply, say, January 1st of this year for priority of Killam and get accepted, and then apply January 1st of 2021 for Birch and have two consecutive projects going on at the same time with two different end dates with MSBA? I, I'm quite sure the answer is no. And if you technically could, you would probably be very hard to prevail amongst the competition at that second round. Uh, Pat Tompkins, I have one question going back to the timeline. Mm -hmm. um, this gentleman brought up before, but we have all the time there adds up to five years. Yeah. Um, and you've got a total of three and a half years. Um, just looking at all those activities, they seem to happen in series. You know, the feasibility, you can't start the schematic until the feasibility is done and so forth. Um, so is there overlap there? Well, well or is the three and a half years meant? Well, yeah, so for instance, when you finish the eligibility period and, and you, you have 150 days to get a designer and OPM on board, so that's part of what you're going to agree to in that ICC that I mentioned, okay? Right. But that is part of the feasibility study timeline. That that overlaps. Okay. But they, you know, so you have 300 days to finish that. You can't, you know, wait 290 days and then go hire, you know, OPM. Okay. So they're looking and they're monitoring that that you keep moving with the process. So some of that is consecutive. Yes. Okay. So, but. To press that a little further, there's one and a half years or 18 months missing, and that's five of those months yep. if the entire OPM 150 days is within the feasibility study. Um, so I guess my question is, is it assumed there's a, a one and a half years of overlap, or is it assumed that some of those activities are going to happen quicker? It, well, I, the, but part of, there are certain dates that you have to commit to. 
Mm -hmm. And part of what I wanted to convey here is that this is sort of the minimum speed that this is going to happen at. Okay. Um, and again, like we say, you know, final design year, construction one and a half years. Which is say about right. One elementary school should not take the one and a half years, but it can, depending on phasing, if you you know you're doing a part and so on. But you know, the three and a half years with the overlap, and so three and a half, you know, generically we would say. If there's a good consensus and everybody's ready to go, you know, it's five years till you're occupying that building. So, okay. but, but it is important that if you enter this process, it, it moves along. There is, you know, by, by design, there's a lot of things that you have to make happen um, faster than comfortable, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey there, uh, Vince Kane, Wakefield Street. Uh, I know that a lot of folks at the Killam School would have been interested in being here tonight, but they're in a, a cyber security or cyber safety session. Um, so my wife sent me to take notes. <laughs> Thank you for the, uh, the copy of the presentation. On the slide where it concludes that the use of the Killam site is um, you know, most appropriate, it looks like there's a graphic, and I'm not sure if the, if the graphic is a tell, but it reflects sort of scheme C. And w w with the preservation of a modular, I'm just wondering if we should be reading into that, or what is the process by which sort of any of these schemes are endorsed or ranked? Um, I, I also noticed that's the cheapest. Right. I missed the scheme C thing, but well, the yeah, scheme. It's the it's the schematic for scheme C. It's not cheap. The, right after scheme H. The slide right after scheme H. So it's, it's, it is the scheme that seems to be the cheapest and also keeps the student body size the smallest. The yeah, point. so that one of the, that, the reason that's green and yellow is we were trying to see if we could, you know, do a renovation of the existing building. Um, and that's partly why it comes out cheaper. Um, we don't know how we would accomplish that uh, phasing wise. So there is probably a very significant cost temporary to do something with the school while you renovate that building, um, as, which is one of the problems with it. We don't really know how we would accomplish that. So just to be clear, um, schemes A and B are, are rehabs of the Killam School. Uh, no, scheme, no, scheme A and B is assuming Demolishing the okay, existing. Okay, that's a demolishing tip. Right. Yeah, demolishing the existing and building a new school, but not in that order. But yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Andrew McLaughlin again. I'm just gonna. Uh, I want to double hit on um, kind of what he was getting at. So um, it's a significantly less option than the other options, right? Yes. Um, and it sounds like the biggest trouble is how to estimate um, your containment and alternate, or let's call it enabling of the project, right? Uh, is, that, is that what you were kind of getting it, at? It, sorry, the, the, the phasing and how to implement it, yes. The, right, the how to imp implement yep. or enable the, the project to happen. Yep. Um, uh, so, so there's no data out there currently right now for stuff like that, like uh, the Hastings School in Lexington that they're doing a current renovation and rehab while the school's occupied? Um, well, yes, there is, but it, it, the, the scope of work that you're probably doing there, I don't think you can do it while it's occupied. Um, and, and you don't have enough space, say, to, to vacate one wing and you know, and do one wing, yep. that, that has its own complications, but even okay. apart from that, yeah. And then um, to continue on to that, my question would be, um, as a cost, is the difference potentially, for instance, as a temporary, um, uh, temporary, yeah, temporary space school in order somewhere or something. To, make, to make that happen, um, you know, there's a difference in 50 million. Yeah. You know? So I think that's a significant, uh, 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 kind of flexibility to potentially make that happen. Um, if there is, you know, um, I know this is all options. I'm sure there was 50 other options that you guys looked at. Right. But uh, just, uh, just to add, a, I think what 
you are implying is saying, oh, the other ones are 90 million, this one's 46, and if it's gonna take three and a half years and we're looking for the funding, we have to fund the OPM um, and we need 46 million, you could do simple math and just divide 46 by five years and say, okay, that's what we need to try and come up with. Okay, and um, that, that's a hard number to get to, especially since the process from the state um, that you have to go through and that to add to that, what Tom was saying, so I get that you can't apply the next fiscal year immediately for another project on your master plan, but if you have uh, if you have a projected end date or ribbon cutting date of a project, couldn't you apply prior to prior to that, knowing that the process takes time to approve, so that way it, one ends and the other one begins? Yeah, as I, far as breaking ground goes. Yeah, I have to admit I don't know the definitive answer to that, but we do not see that happening in other communities. I, I'm, I'm quite sure you've, you, you know, you have to be very close to finishing at least the one project before you're going to apply for the next. Again, and it may be technically allowed, but, um, you know, there's there's communities that have, you know, a 25% enrollment increase or something, you right. know, and so it's hard to prevail, you know, for that second project, you know. Okay. This does go in, again, to, well, just to blurt it out, I mean, that's one advantage of doing, like, a single big school. <laughs> right. You know, this is one project, it solves the problem, and, and you're done. But there's other, you know, just all these other considerations as well. Yeah. So... Uh, with the, those other considerations, when you hire an LPM or hire a design team, um, could you hire that design team for your master plan and double down on what you're doing? Well, you, you could, the, there's the, the, again, the, the um, MSBA is expecting you will have kind of gotten through that level like we're talking about to identify. Now, you could go forward with let's say a project on the Killam site, and part of the feasibility study is to evaluate and conclude whether it is feasible to renovate, you know, and save some money, or whether it's better to demolish the school and mm -hmm. do a new school. That would be something that would be, say, investigated during the feasibility study. Okay. Um, but they would be expecting you to have thought through enrollment and, you know, the big picture enough to know whether you want to do that first or do something at Birch. Okay. So, so what I'm essentially getting at is um, allocation of funds mm -hmm. to try and cover two scopes instead of one, mm -hmm. uh, meaning final design is there a way to, if we can't overlap, to kind of skip go, right, and include the portion of let uh, we do our feasibility. We say it's uh, Killam is more advantageous for whichever scope there would be over doing Birch Meadow, but Birch Meadow is part of our master plan when it comes to final design. Can we include that final design to be of two projects versus one and have it still the MSBA accept it? Again, I, I 90 percent sure the answer to that is no. They're, they're going to look for one project and think of that as one site, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and do that project before you have two in the pipeline. Okay. Thank you. So, Tom, uh, Dale, uh, hold on a second. We haven't talked about it yet, and maybe you can't answer, but uh, can you just talk a, a little bit about the, the climate at MSBA and, and, you know, do they have, I mean, there's been years when they don't have money to, to give out, and then I've heard right. that they're in, so what's the, the and, and to that point, uh, we've had on a periodic basis, uh, I'm not sure who, John, but came through and evaluated Killam, and it may not get approved because they don't think anything's wrong with it. So that would mean our other issues would have to be very robust, the enrollment and, and programmatic things to get the money, right? Because we're not necessarily going to get the money because Killam's in disrepair. And it needs, Correct. Right? Uh, right? You follow what? So. Yeah, so, it, so there is a lot. Uh, I, there has been talk about increasing, you know, the amounts, and that's every year that's talked about. Some years it's it happens. It's part of the new, not, that budget that yeah. 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 is being debated. Yeah, well, I mean. um, but there, there is a lot of competition 
you know, for them. And again, it's ranked enrollment is one of the driving factors. And so the fact that you don't have enormous enrollment growth, um, it used to be, well, I'll say the fact that your buildings are well taken care of, you know, is, um, but fortunately, uh, that was one of the things in the revamp that I think MSBA has tr has tried to really address and not reward towns for not taking care of their buildings by giving them reimbursement because the buildings are not <laughs> in good shape. So that I think MSBA has done a lot to, you know, to take that out of the formula. It's it, but it is enrollment and um, and program space. I mean that is you know that is one of the things. So that's one of the things that you have going. The fact that the schools are smaller. You know, but again, I don't want to mislead. It's they're not dramatically smaller than you know right. other schools of that you know of that time. You know, so um, you're, it's going to be a, um, it will be very competitive. You know, to apply, and I, I think it's a, a right answer to say it's not that they say no, you're not eligible, or you know, you're somehow disqualified. It's just that you don't stack up in the priorities against other communities that have ranked lower. applied. You're ranked lower, right? Yeah. Well, if, you, if you're not ranked, I mean, if you're ranked lower, you're probably not going to get the money, right? Yeah. So. It, well, for that year, yeah. but then. But you can you go on the waiting list. Yes, yeah, you go on the waiting list. So when you go on the waiting list, you don't have to start over again uh, with. Um, because all of this costs money too to do. Correct. It. You know, Correct. So, uh, I think if you're if you're on the waiting list and they simply don't have enough money to go around, you don't start over. When you start over is if you go down the path, and you know they're they're basically tying up X millions of dollars dependent upon your town vote to fund the project, and you don't fund it. Then they say, "Okay, we're giving that money to somebody else," um, and and then you start over in that process. Now, again, you've done enrollment projections. You have, you know, but but you start over in terms of their evaluation the next year uh, for a priority and ranking. So, first to clarify, maybe Andrew's question. Um, in terms of trying to use the OPM, the designer, to do the feasibility study, the schematic design, et cetera, we have that tight time window. Yes. Right? And we have to contract them to do part of the, to, to do at least what we have said we want to do as our priority project. Correct. Is it, is it absolutely restricted that if we fulfill it ourselves in that time window that they cannot do more? And it's not part oh. of the project, but they could design, do the design and then we know exactly what we're talking about from a future perspective? Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Um, well, again, under that, I'm going to call it site versus project. Under that site, you can advance just as quickly as you want. You basically more have a deadline. But if you, you know, and again, because, you know, this is a smaller school, I mean, there's, there's many, you know, 80, 90, 100 million dollar schools being done, where you're much smaller. If you contracted the OPM and so on, and you funded enough to put it through, you know, 90 percent, and you're at that point when, when the deadline is for schematic, that's fine. I mean, they they love that, you know. And then just go ahead. I was just going to ask. So I just got myself confused. So I thought that we need a commitment that our town is willing to spend the money, whether or not we get the SBA reimbursement. And so if we don't get the reimbursement, what I just heard you say is then we go on a waiting list for the reimbursement. So then we're not following through on our town's commitment to do it anyways. Did I just get very confused? Um, I did. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you apply, if you put in your letter of interest, and and basically it's you don't prevail and be accepted into the the um, certification completion process okay next year you would try to reapply you know you could be accepted into that and put on a waiting list but not 
get that funding. Last year, um, it was, four, I think, four towns got the funding for their specific project. But I believe those who met the, you know, the, those certain <coughs> criteria are on a waiting list to look for the next year. But, but again, someone, you're on the waiting list, but someone else with a higher ranking can still right. come in right. and pass by you. So it's almost like reapplying. I mean, just um, to share uh, some reinforcement for your talking about the needs of other communities. I was just at the Mass Association of School Committees meeting, and I was in a meeting with an assistant superintendent from Hopkinton, and overnight they got 500 new students in their district. And so they're looking at crisis, like do we build, do we get modulars, do we do both, how are we going to deal with that? So. Um, there's very real issues going on in other districts with numbers as well. It was quite striking. They didn't expect it. <laughs> Pat, did you have something? Um, uh, yeah, just getting back to the, the, um, the question of the priority, and I, I don't know that you 100% know the answer to this, but I've always known like MSBA has their capital pipeline, and I've always known there to be multiple projects from the same municipality throughout the pipeline. So if you could just check with that and get back, because I think that's an important question. And generally speaking, they actually kind of come in clusters, like Lexington pushed out like three projects in a two or three year time period, and they all sat in that pipeline. So if you could just check that and yep. get back affirmatively yep. to the committee, whether you can or can't have more than one project in the pipeline. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank so you. we would, you know, not be surprised or anticipate, you know, that as you gel it, there will be questions and refinements. But you know, to get an overview, you know, was, you have to. So what I would recommend to the committee is that and you can do it as a public hearing or you can just do it as a regular school committee meeting either way and this would be your agenda item for the evening where you would invite the community we could do a, a short presentation not at the length we did tonight very short presentation have the information available um, and, and allow the community to ask questions give feedback um, on the different schemes. Um, I would recommend you do that a few times. Do it at various times of the day, so maybe a morning one, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, an evening one, that type of thing. Um, so th that would be, to me, the next steps. I, this, I don't see this happening with the budget process coming up in January, probably not until the February, March piece. It would be my guess, but if the committee wants to accelerate that, we'd have to figure that out. Um, and there'll be a presentation on this of some sort to town meeting. So I plan on not doing no, I, this, I, no, but as part of the state of the schools, right. I was going to include some pieces of this, so, yes. So there'll be some heads up to town meeting. I guess the only thing I would like to add is when we get to the place of thinking about public hearings to give information, but also hear back from the community what their preferences and questions are, um, to think through an electronic component of that, if it's possible, that some sort of outreach via email or even, you know, if you can't attend a meeting, but email your feedback to us, just to think through an electronic component. Sure. Would like Good point. To participate in that way. Thank you. And yes. I, I would also, if we can at all, try to avoid conflict. I know the calendar is so full and there's so much happening, but if we can try to avoid having other big events happening on the same night. Well, I mean, that's yeah. only within our, we can only control what we do. I mean, if other <coughs> groups are making plans, I, we can't tell them not. We'll do our best. Yeah. We'll do our best. Thank you. Just to, I think that's a good reason for doing what Dr. Jordy said, which is multiple dates, multiple times. Right. So if there is a big event you want 
Yeah. You should probably be able to figure out one that works. Dan? Um, my question is, uh, my name is Dan Doerr. I'm from on FinCom. Um, the process to narrow it down to a couple plans, what, how, how long is that process? And do you guys lean into as one particular scheme? I think after, I can, you know, I think after, after what we just discussed with the public input and, and uh, you know, various stakeholders, and we'll then uh, put that all together and, and make a decision <coughs> at that point as to what scheme. I mean, we're not going to make the scheme amongst ourselves. We're going right. to do it with, with your input. And, and so one other question is um, on scheme G. <coughs> You're talking about demolishing Birch Meadow and redistrict. What happens to to that land? Because it won't exist anymore, correct? <coughs> well, I don't. I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I, I'm, I don't think I'm in favor of demolishing anything. I'd probably want to leave it vacant. So and do something with it because you never know when you might. Like to your point, we would have had a place to put students uh, when we were tearing down another building so right we, we, that's way <coughs> down the road I think that when we I mean decide whether whether we're going to demolish something or not uh, I don't think we're there yet uh, it's it, that scheme it's not necessarily demolishing it it could be just leaving it yeah. vacant and it could be repurposed for another use whether it be a town building or something like that thank you yeah it was really it was really just in the in the gambit of options you know, would would you, would it be advantageous educationally to the school to have four sites versus five? I mean, there's a wind blowing of saying, would it be better to have six? But you don't have a site; it doesn't seem like something to pursue, right? So. The reason I ask that because I know there's been a lot of other ideas and of different mm -hmm. things floated around to to other building needs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, just curious. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senior Center. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take a two minute recess if you want to. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> what happened? Did they give away land? She didn't, she didn't go into it. Um, they, no, they moved. Oh, I know what it was. They built a new um, apartment oh. complex. And so part of it was. It was man made. People move in. Yeah. Oh. I think that's what. It, I can't swear to that, but I think. Hi, Maura. <laughs> Bye, thank you. <laughs> so the apps went out. Thank you, Joe. We see UMass Amherst. Thank you. Now we're going to uh, continue our discussion on the superintendent's uh, goal. Thank you. So one of the pieces that um, 
we discussed that perhaps the committee wanted to look at is whether or not uh, the focus is on, uh, and DESE recommends if you're going to go this route, eight indicators versus looking at all of the indicators. So what I put in the packet is the, the overall sheet, the summary of all of the indicators that are under the four standards. So you can see that each standard, depending on which it is, has a different number of indicators. What I've done in boldface um, is identified two indicators from each standard. Um, and where I came up with these is based on the goals and the direction that the district is going based on the district improvement plan and my goals, which were approved at the last meeting. So I can quickly identify to you the indicators that I chose and my rationale behind it. So under standard one, oh, I, I do want to preface at the beginning, I could have picked all of them. I mean, there's, yep. there's an argument to be made for all of these. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I tried to do is identify the ones that were most relevant to the work that we're doing for this year. Um, so under standard one, I chose uh, B and E. Uh, I could have easily also chosen A because we are doing a lot of work this year with curriculum, but I chose B because there's a lot of professional development that's going to be, that has been happening and will continue to be happening this year in terms of equity, in terms of um, the instructional methodology that we're, we're using um, in, in a variety of areas and how we're addressing the needs of all students. So that is very consistent with um, really the, the goal of the district improvement plan. Um, in terms of E, one of the three strategic objectives is data. Um, so I focused, I, I picked E for that reason, that that is one of the three buckets or uh, strategic objectives that, um, that you approved in, as part of the district improvement plan. And again, could have picked any of them, but those are the, the two, if we're going to, Focus on any of those would be the two. Under standard two, um, I chose A and I chose C. Um, for A, the reason being is because of three and four, the social emotional well-being, student health and safety, which is one of the goals that I have um, in the superintendent's annual plan. Um, and for the reason for C is how are we going to provide the time for the teachers, both for the, the PD piece, the training, and the time to collaborate and develop the curriculum maps, the guides, all of the things that are very consistent with some of the strategic initiatives that are in the district improvement plan. So that, and again, I could have picked, you know, se several of the others as well. Under three, I chose A uh, and D. Um, this is really tied into the vision piece, um, which I believe is the fourth goal I have in, uh, um, in the annual plan, is how do you engage the community in having that discussion. Uh, it also, very consistent to what we heard this evening, we're going to need to get community engagement on uh, the space study and how we're moving forward with the different schemes. Um, and then the family concern piece is how do you continually, in a timely way, to address uh, the concerns brought forth by families on a variety of different issues. Um, and then on standard four, the two that I chose was C, the communication piece, and E, the shared vision development, would C, the communication skills. Obviously, a lot of the things that we're going to be working on this year, which include the vision development, um, engaging the community in the discussion about elementary space, um, budget, you know, all of the different areas, um, and then just the regular uh, communication that we have in different areas. Um, I believe that that was kind of tying in all of the other three sets of indicators that we had already, I had already uh, identified. And then the shared vision really ties back into the, the, the um, division of the graduate piece again from four. Um, and again, I think you could make a, 
argument for others as well. But that was my rationale for choosing those eight. Okay, I'll open up any questions. Yes. Um, so, uh, my bias would be to not limit to the eight and to continue to do the evaluation process the way we traditionally have looking at all of them. But full disclosure, I'm very comfortable doing it either way because we can look at all of them under either scenario. So, I, I feel like I can work either way. Mr. Weiss. I guess just a question, and maybe Dr. Dury, you might be the best to answer this, or I'm not sure, maybe Jean. If, if we did limit it to these eight, do we think about maybe they get a higher weighting? I mean, how do we, you know, in terms of the actual summative when the time comes, right? Do we say that, you know, the two in each section get a double weight per section? I mean, just trying to think of the logistics of it when it comes to the summative since most of the summative is weighted at the current, I mean, it's just even weighted at the current time. So I guess that kind of plays into, at least in my mathematical head, whether we do this or we stick to all of them. And so do we have a vision or a view of how we would use this uh, at the end of the year with regards to weighting or whether it's, these are the only two that really matter in the summative, right? And the other ones are good for feedback, but the summative ties to these two per each one of these standards. There are, I don't remember exactly whether the DSC, DSC So DSC yeah. doesn't recommend weighting um, because they feel that all of these have equal footing in the role that the superintendent plays. If you want to go that route, I would just say then evaluate on all of them rather than do a weight. also have to have some consistency on the committee about how we approach because what I just said was if these are the eight that we're highlighting I can still evaluate on all of them but in the event that two or three committee members evaluated on all and a few committee members decided I'm not really going to evaluate at all I'm only going to evaluate on these eight or I'm only you know I'm not going to really put too much work into that I've been able to do a summative because we all fully do it all I can see a situation where two committee members made a point in an un highlighted section and it doesn't make it into the summative because other people just weren't answering or putting the effort into it. So I think that I don't really have an answer to it, but it brings up a really valid point, which is if we went this route, we'd have to have some discussion and consistency about are we only actually going to rate and do narrative on these eight? Are we going to do all of them? It's, it's a really good question. I don't have an answer for it, but it is a potential hiccup for sure. And then the other question is, do I provide evidence on all of them still or just the eight? So if you provide evidence on only the eight, if you provide evidence on only the eight, you really can't be evaluating you because then we're all picking our own evidence. So it is a little tricky. So I, I, I appreciate, you know, that you narrowed it down to the eight and, and I agree with the eight, uh, but I guess I, there's still some things amongst, I don't even know how many are there in total. Yeah. That, <laughs> that I, I will, probably feel compelled to have something to say on and uh, but I wouldn't want to do that if, if we were just so I guess I'd like to stick with all of them but I'm not trying to create more I'm fine either way yeah. I mean I agree with you I don't know how you could not evaluate me on say fiscal systems yeah. <laughs> I didn't pick that one because <laughs> that's part of it's the, housekeeping it, well, it's not, yeah, I don't know if it's housekeeping. <laughs> well, it's something we yeah, have it's to Yeah, it's part do. of the job. It's not, a, it's not a goal. It's part of the job. Yeah. It's not that important. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to take that one. <laughs> I think I'd, I'd feel more comfortable being able to comment on all versus limiting to eight. Um, if we can focus on eight and then answer all, that's fine. But I think it, looking at this, I think there's focus on every one of these that we should be looking at. Okay. I would add to it too, this is a, an entirely new process. Yes. It's not an entirely new process. It's it's a, this is a pilot 
for yeah. this rubric. So there could be an argument for let's do it the way we've consistently done it in the past for one year and then maybe reach out to some other communities find out. Did, did, you know, are you aware of other superintendents or school committees that focus on AIDS? How did they address the waiting issue? How did they, it might be interesting to let someone if else. There's waiting. There, there are some workshops. Uh, there's at least one workshop coming up that I'm aware of that I'm, I plan on attending in late November, that, which I find the timing interesting since, it, yeah, it's a word, yeah. But I'm, I plan on going and getting further information for next year. I think to, to, to Gene's point, uh, being that it's the first year of this new, I don't think it's the year to start paring it back until we've gone through it. Would, would we be comfortable as a committee? I know from the educator in the classroom standpoint, um, you're typically you develop your goals and then you really are only providing evidence on the standards that relate directly to those goals. So we, as far as providing, if we were um, requiring Dr. Dory to only provide evidence for the eight, but we were still able to evaluate all, is that, or does that not sit well with people? Uh, I, well, I'll, I'll say my, I think that, I think if we're going to be drawing value judgments on all of them, Dr. Dari is going to want to have an opportunity to give us the evidence for all, right? I mean. Yeah, no, that, that's a valid point. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. I was going to say the same thing, so. Linda, I see I had just. So my initial inclination was it's a lot of work to pull together all the evidence for all of the standards, um, the indicators, sorry. But after listening to Mrs. Borowski and the conversation, the reality is that there's a lot of work going on outside these indicators that deserve to be acknowledged, that fill out the picture of what you're doing but I hate to make you do the work to pull together all the evidence. We have some, but it wouldn't necessarily, I mean, we have a lot of it that we've experienced ourselves, but to Mrs. Borowski's point, it wouldn't create a consistent pool that we'd be drawing from, so it lo might get lost in her report, from her report, it wouldn't. So if I could just respond to that. So the evidence, is more of a collection of documents that has been going on throughout the year. If I have to create something, then it didn't happen. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's more putting them in the drop boxes, which is an administrative task that takes a couple hours. It's not the creation of evidence in May to put in the drop box because it's been happening all year. So I don't look at it as a lot of additional work. To, to put okay. evidence together. Okay, it just is so much, it, there's so much evidence from our past experiences and that I have appreciated, but for all of it, I understand you're not creating it, it just is work to find it and put it in, but I trust you have a system to I streamline that. I do. <laughs> You just default to. Okay. So I'll let someone else on the committee say if they love the motion first. <laughs> Anyone else? No. So I don't think we need a motion. No. Nope. Okay. So I have guidance. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we need to point somebody to the human, no. The uh, ad hoc. The ad hoc. Ad hoc uh, human rights committee uh, in, in, in Lane's absence, and we need to do it, I, I mean, soon, or tonight, because I, think, I don't think they can meet until. They're having difficulty getting a quorum because there's only, I believe, five members, right, that right. can vote. There are only five vo voting members. It works on a consensus. So those five members will vote according to what the whole committee does, but we need the five to be there for the vote to happen. So, Linda, 
And then, you know, Dr. Doxter, if you don't mind, can you just talk briefly about the commitment? Are you, because you're part of it now. So sure. Now. So the mission of the group is to create the mission and the structure of a human rights organization for Reading. So we already know we're going to create a human rights organization, but what that is going to look like and what the mission is going to be is what we're trying to come up with. And we're trying to do it in time to decide where it's going to fit in the organization of the town, whether we're going to go to town meeting for an endorsement. Those are the things that we're making the decisions of. And we have been trying to meet every two weeks, um, but that's been challenging to get the dates and the quorum. And I wanted to look. I think the next meeting is the 27th, 26th, Tuesday. Tuesday, November 26th. Yeah, sorry. I just didn't trust myself. Tuesday, November 26th. So we're trying to get an appointment before then. Um, it's a short-term commitment in that once there is a human rights organization, then whatever our bylaws that, or the structure is, we're going to determine how people are going to be, become members of the human rights organization. This is um, in order to form that human rights organization. So once it's formed, then you're, the liaison from here is not necessarily going to be a part of that human rights organization unless the committee decides and the person wants to continue. Um, that's not determined yet because that's part of the structure that we're working on. So is anybody in, from the committee interested? Or? I would be willing to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you'll need to get sworn in. Oh, well, well, we get if, <laughs> well, you asked me process. Oh. Sorry, did both? <laughs> I was just going to say that whoever is chosen would need to get sworn in with the town clerk. Okay. I would like to move to appoint Patricia Kelly as a liaison to the school committee. Um, oh, this is not right. <laughs> I move to appoint Patricia Kelly as a liaison to the human rights ad hoc committee from the school committee. Is there a second? Second. <coughs> Can I add something to that? Sorry. Yes that a qualifier so what I just said might have another step as well because this it's a select board ad hoc so you'd have to get sworn in but you also have to get appointed by the whatever their committee's sure. name is the volunteer appointment committee VAC or something like that so it would be meeting with that committee as well to be appointed and then get sworn in you don't think so well, when I was appointed back before they changed to the structure they have now, I didn't have to meet with the committee. They just announced it at, at the slack board meeting. And so I did have to get sworn in. Approved it. At mm -hmm. So I guess that has to be this clarified. Is our appointment, yeah. right? So where are the appointing committee? Well, I've been told both things. I've been told it's their appointment to their committee, but it's from, it's our recommendation for who should be there from the school committee, if that makes sense. Right, we can sort but, that out. Let's yeah. have a vote on this. All those in favor? Great. Thank you. Thanks. You can vote for yourself. And uh, <laughs> now we, uh, I wanted to discuss the Festival of Trees. And uh, just, I don't know. Did, did you want to, you had, that you would ask me to put that? Sure. So um, the Festival of Trees is coming. It's a major fundraiser for the Reading Education Foundation. It's a community builder and a fun event. And um, the Reading Education Foundation does so much for our schools. I would love for us to do another exhibit at the Reading Education at the uh, Festival of Trees. Um, so what it entails is creating an exhibit that will then be raffled off. The raffle tickets bought are the fundraiser, and the, the exhibits there range from trees that are 
Christmassy. I'm going to pick my words. Um, but there are also other exhibits. They're becoming really creative. And um, my personal opinion is um, last year, um, with the committee's help, we did a snowman and on the theme of individual flakes are um, beautiful. And together, they create a snowstorm. There's real power in working together. Um, I'm no, I, no one can, uh, my husband can't yell at me from here. So I'm willing to, <laughs> to organize this um, if someone <laughs> wants to help too. Um, <laughs> but I think it's really, what, what'd you say? I said, how do I put that in there? It don't, please. <laughs> um, but I think it's, my personal opinion is that it's, really important that we support the Reading Education Foundation by doing an exhibit. And so um, I'd like to make a motion that we do an exhibit for the Reading Education Foundation Festival of Trees. Yes. Thank you so, so much for volunteering. It's, <laughs> it's a really great event, and I'm happy to support any that I can. Thank you. Thank you. And um, clarification, so what we've done in the past is that we all chip in for what we spend for the exhibit. And I would get to you what a reasonable, I'm very frugal, <laughs> but also very conscious that it needs to be something wonderful that people will cherish when they get it home. Buy tickets for it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we don't need it in an emotion. No, you don't. You don't. No? Okay. And the date of that, so everybody knows, the 28th, is December it? December 7th and 8th. December 7th and 8th yeah. is the tree festival. OK, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Oh, the 6th. I will definitely need help on the 6th for setting up. I might be, hopefully, at a conference. They have a little bit late, so don't worry. OK. <laughs> <laughs> very late that night. <laughs> So now we'll do reports. Uh, you, Gail, did you, or did we? I'm, uh, the only brief update I will give is that we are still making great progress on turf two. I think folks have started to drive around. We are now in the final stages of it. We're hoping within the next week, weather permitting, that we'll be doing our final punch list. So we are still making great progress as part of the update at town meeting when the state of the schools we will have some pictures to sort of go from beginning to end because we were asked to give a brief update on that so once we know the definitive end date we will let folks know but we are still progressing nicely all of the shrubs and trees and everything went in there testing the lights so we're in really good shape with it Great. Dr. Stiles. So. <laughs> Sorry, we have to do pass the mic. Um, very quickly, we were just able to get confirmation um, from the state that our tiered focus monitoring, they're going to be sending um, a representative from the state who's going to be leading our process um, in December to meet with parents. And so in all likelihood, it will be part of the December CPAC meeting and more information um, will be forthcoming, but part of the process is to have parent input, and so we will be trying to reach out to people to make sure that everybody's well informed. And um, the other piece to that is hot off the presses. We just received um, letters from the monitoring um, Office of Public Monitoring, and we have. Um, receive confirmation that all of our indicators they've commended us for our commitment and our responsiveness um, to submitting all the data and they've approved it all so that's it thank you kelly no reports tonight you're taking notes no reports yeah. um, The select board met on Tuesday, uh, October 29th, and they did vote to maintain the current split um, 
tax rate split of 1.02 residential commercial, so that will be maintained consistent. Um, I also wanted to update the committee on something that happened in public comment, just to sort of close the loop. Um, a couple of meetings ago, we had a letter in our packet regarding a softball field, and I just wanted to let the committee know that at this meeting, the writer of that letter and several other parents with similar concerns approached the select board and specifically thanked Dr. Doherty and Mr. Robinson for um, reaching out and letting him know that that field's under the care and custody of the town through the recreation department, and um, they shared their concerns to the um, to the select board. So that that um, person who wrote to us is going through the right process to have those concerns heard. Got one more. Um, the CPAC met two nights ago on the 5th. This was exciting because it was the first meeting with the new board. Mm -hmm. um, so they led the meeting. Um, as I mentioned before, these four women have stepped up and volunteered to run the, C uh, run the CPAC for this year. They're working very collaboratively together. They have already begun and in some cases completed open meeting law training. So they know they need to do that and they did it right away. Um, they're looking at possibly getting some outside um, advice and education about the roles, responsibilities, obligations of a CPAC. So they're looking to outside people to help them build a good foundation for the group. Um, we spent part of the meeting brainstorming priorities for the year, and there are two sort of big ideas that came up. Um, and I'll introduce here. Dr. Stiles, if I get any of this wrong, just jump right in. <laughs> um, so the CPAC has historically and will continue to be a resource for information, resources, and support for parents. They're looking to continue that, of course, but they actually would like to expand it if possible in some areas. Their other big agenda or sort of priority for the year is to increase parent engagement, mm -hmm. which is something that I, I think they're on the exact right track. They need to do that to become a vibrant, strong organization. So I, I'm very impressed with the work that they've already, they hit the ground strong. Um, one member of the CPAC who is not on the board of the CPAC has volunteered to be the budget parent for the CPAC. So they're going to have not only me as the liaison who's involved in the budget process, but also a parent who's a member of the CPAC with that budget expertise. So there's just a lot of good stuff happening there. Dr. Stiles was present um, and gave an update to the CPAC on the Joshua Eaton dyslexia pilot, which we all heard ourselves at our last meeting and also the work that's being done between her and her staff and um, Ms. Boynton and the high school staff to create a smooth, um, very intentional transition for some special education students from Coolidge who are eighth graders who next year will be in ninth grade at the high school. So people were really happy to hear that. Um, I did want to share with the committee, there was one sort of hiccup at the end and um, it impacts how we as a committee operate and also how we communicate with the CPAC. So at the end of the meeting, a board member read an email that she had received directly from an individual school committee member about future action the school committee might take. Understandably, the CPAC then looked to me to answer questions about it, and I didn't really have the information I needed to do so. So it kind of created a challenge for me to be an effective liaison. Um, and I think in some case, in this case, the committee wasn't even aware necessarily of some of this. So, um, so I've been thinking through, it was fine. The, it was quickly determined by the CPAC that there wasn't enough information. I didn't have enough information to move forward with, with the topic. But in thinking it through, I, I would remind the committee that we do have a protocol that any email that we do as school committee members needs to be copied to the chair at a minimum, so that's our protocol. And I think moving forward as the liaison to CPAC, I'd certainly appreciate being copied on email correspondence, um, just so that I can be an effective liaison. This is a fabulous group of women who are really dedicated to doing the right thing for our kids, and I wanna be the strongest liaison I can be for them, but I, I, that would really help me do the job well. So, but it's a great meeting. Mm -hmm. I haven't even yet. <laughs> Uh, next rec meeting is the 13th, and I did have a chance to go to the MCAS meeting at Coolidge. Um, it was a great meeting, 45 minutes. Um, she answered every question that was asked, and it was solid. Great. Dr. Dodds. Um, just a very quickly, um, Rokasa met and is continuing work on their reorganization and they're continuing work on vaping education and were recently at Parker to present and um, we already did the ad hoc. Thank you. Move. Okay. Um, I moved for the school committee to enter into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel and to return to public session at approximately 9.30. Second. Okay. Is there a roll, roll call? call. Yeah. Oh. 
Dr. Doctor. Yes. 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 We'll go down on that. So, uh, call the uh, school committee meeting back to order. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Just uh, the motion. Just read the motion. And when they came back. Yes. Um, I move to approve the superintendent's salary um, for, I move to approve the superintendent's salary at $187,650, which represents a 2.5% pay increase effective in the current pay cycle. Second. Or second. And so uh, we, as you know, we talked for a while uh, <laughs> and uh, obviously talked about the uh, your current, you know, the year we're in now uh, and had a lot of dialogue and felt that you know, that was, uh, it wasn't necessarily what was in the budget, but w what we were, the committee was comfortable with uh, for the rest of the year. But we also uh, uh, put in as a, it, when we're building the budget, uh, a $200,000 uh, salary to, and what we, you know, all those things we, see going on and so hopefully that will you know be able to make that decision in June to get you to there move to adjourn is, we, we, well, we have, we does anyone else have anything Sorry. they want to say or? No. just thank you for your performance and the, your evaluation was positive and I'm looking I can only speak for myself I'm looking forward to working with you and hearing your accolades this week was quite powerful at the conference. So we need to vote on the motion. All those in favor? I think it's roll call. No, oh, is it? Roll call. Oh. no just a regular. Oh, okay. just a regular. Okay. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you. <laughs>